911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? It was. It was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is Jim, Ron, and Chris from the Irish Bigfoot Research Organization. Welcome to the show, guys. Hi, Thanks, folks. Man. How are you? Thanks, Brian. Great to be here, really, and a uh, big fan of the show and uh, looking forward to uh, tonight's uh, tonight's uh, show. It's evening awesome. time over here, but it's 2 p.m. Uh, your side, so a bit of time difference. Just a little bit. I appreciate you guys making it work with the time difference and being here and being on time and ready to rock and roll. So let's go around the horn, and this is an encounter show. So, Jim, why don't you take it from the top and tell everybody a little bit about the Irish Bigfoot Research Organization, and then we'll get into some of your personal encounters. Yeah, Brian, we've been up and running about five or six years now, myself and uh, Chris started it off uh, many, many years ago, so five years ago. But uh, we've been a uh, little bit of research here and there. We've been uh, investigating the stories, uh, the local stories that we've been having over the years here, uh, being told uh, you can search up on Google or anything like that. But basically, it's word of mouth. People in Ireland don't really, uh, they're not very talkative if, uh, you know, they'd be, uh, they'd be frowned upon, basically or telling the people think they're crazy and stuff like that. I suppose that goes with everywhere you went, you know. But uh, yeah, my interest uh, myself, uh, I remember when I was a kid and I seen the uh, the Patterson Gimnel uh, footage when I was a, a wee small lad, you know. So that stuck with me for a, for a long, long time. And uh, would you believe it or not, it was, uh, if anything, it was Finding Bigfoot show that really opened all the, it brought the subject forward. And it brought a lot of new people, including myself, into the you know into the fray, as they say, and uh, got interested in it. Then really uh, watched all the shows, and it was very exciting. But you know, they never really found much. But but still, it really did bring the subject forward, and that's how I got interested in it. And at the moment, I am the current uh, president of the organisation. We have uh, three instalments of our documentary series out on Amazon Prime at the moment. So, uh, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. So uh, that's where we are. So I don't know what uh, what else we can do. Personal encounters, I do have personal encounters, but uh, we'll save those just for a little bit. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Finding Bigfoot because I'm actually sitting down with Cliff Brackman tomorrow for an interview. And I've been excited about that for a while because Cliff, that show did a lot. Like you said, I think it brought it yeah. into the mainstream. It brought Bigfoot into people's living rooms and whether they found much or not is, is a little bit subjective, but I think it did a lot in, in a lot of ways, negative and positive for the subject. So I'm really excited to, to sit down and talk to Cliff tomorrow. Let's just go continue around the horn. Let's talk a little bit to Ron. Let's go to Ron and talk about what got you interested in the subject and what brought you into the organization. Hi, Brian. Um, I started off watching um, just a nature documentary a few years back and I'd seen the Independence Day footage of you know, the Bigfoot running across the hillside and they did a recreation of that and they brought in a, an athlete to try run that terrain as well and the athlete couldn't do it so that got my brain thinking as such but it was always in the back of my head. Uh, a couple of years on from that then, similar to Jim, my boys started watching um, Finding Bigfoot and obviously I'd sit in and watch it with him and that kind of 
got me thinking about Jesus. I remember that film I saw a few years ago, the footage, like, and I started watching it then and got interested in it. Then I just started um, researching a bit more, more then, and kind of seeing what the, the scene was like in Europe and in the UK. It's fairly big, and you have big uh, following for Dogman Encounters as well, uh, amongst other stuff. And I got in touch with the guys then, and they had already filmed their first documentary. So they brought me on board then for the second one. So that's where I'm at at this stage, short and sweet. Awesome. And Chris, bless his heart, who is out in the field in the middle of nowhere in the dark standing by. Chris, welcome to the show, man. Why don't you talk a little bit about what got you interested in the subject and brought you into the organization? And then kind of tell us where you're at and what kind of experiences you guys have had in that area. Well, firstly, hey, Brian, and I, I can't wait to see that show with Cliff as well, so I'll be, I'll be standing by watching to see that myself too. But um, my my interest start, stemmed from a very early age, and I was always, um, well, back in, back in our young days, there was no internet, so I was picking up encyclopedias and VHS uh, tapes and all those sorts of things, um, and that's where I got all my interest from. I, I remember seeing the legend of Boggy Creek when I was a little child. I was only probably four or five years of age. And my dad actually let me watch it and that stuck in the head. It terrified me, of course, but um, it did stick in the head. And I was always interested in all those other things. I think most of us guys are the sort of same. We have a little bit of interest in UFOs and, and those sorts of things. Um, but they tend to lean towards anything sort of paranormal or strange or or whatever the case may be. But the Bigfoot was always the one that stood out with me. Uh, it's the one that I thought, even back then, that could possibly be real. Um, there's such an amount of sightings, especially in North America and in Asia, Russia and stuff like that. It was just... Um, the the evidence was, was too much for, for to say no. And um, the thing in Ireland, obviously, um, didn't come until a lot, lot later. Um, I was never in the mind of thinking, like many people probably, that there's even a chance of a Bigfoot being in, in Ireland or the UK or even West Western Europe. But, um, yeah, well, I, I stand back really from The Legend of Boggy Creek, which I thought was a fantastic show. I still think it's a fantastic show. And everything came from there. But the, the interest in Ireland is only new. It's only about maybe six, seven years old. Well, let's talk a little bit about you're out in the field now. What kind of area are you in and what kind of experiences have you guys had out there? This area in particular is just below um, Loch Ness, which is a big lake uh, in, this, in the northern half of Ireland. You can't, you can't mess it on a map. So if you look at a map of Ireland, you're going to see this big lake in the middle of um, the top half of Ireland. And I'm literally just below that, maybe a few miles, if even a few, maybe even less than that. Um, and this area has been known to be extremely active over the years. Uh, I've had a couple of encounters here myself. Um, Jim has had an encounter here, uh, and a few other other members the same. Ron, maybe you've had something happen here too. I can't remember, but um, I know certainly me, Jim, and Anthony were together one night, and we had Bigfoot walking around us. Um, and uh. A couple of nights, I done a couple of live feeds here back in 2019, I think it was. I might have been live on Cryptovania at that point. I can't remember for sure. Jason Frost there at Cryptovania might correct me on that one. But there was definitely big time action that night. We had Idlo directly in front of us. We had Knox behind us. And we had uh, a big foot running up the road alongside me. So um, it was pretty hairy, <laughs> to say the least. What, what about vocalizations, Chris? Are you guys getting vocalizations out there? Because that's one of the things that I've heard here in North Carolina on my property is what sounds like an Ohio howl kind of vocalization. And tons of people are reporting that. I've talked to people just in the last couple of weeks that on the West Coast and the East Coast and in the Southern part of the United States here are hearing basically the same sound. Are you guys hearing vocalizations or at least getting reports of vocalizations out there where you guys are? Absolutely, yes. Uh, probably in the, in the in the sort of bigger areas and the more remote areas out like west, you would get all that. 
um, some of the bogs in the cent in the centre of Midlands, you would get it. But they tend to in this these sort of areas, they would be a lot more discreet. You know, I'm like a lot of Bigfoot believers that think that these creatures are very very intelligent. There is no messing with them. They're not going to beat about the bush, as as they would say. I mean, they're very very smart. They're gonna they're gonna whistle. They're gonna knock maybe, and um, they're gonna clap and um, kick on stuff they got there. But they do make themselves known. Um, but not so much loud vocalizations. But I have been grunted at and growled at in these areas. Um, on on many of occasions and. Howls and stuff they got out, as I say, out west in the bigger areas, you're definitely going to get them. And Jim has heard a few of those, and Ron has heard a few of those. Even in Monathan, I think it was Ron Wade, maybe some had to be Monathan. And um, during the film in part two, maybe? We had one, but it, it was distant. It was distant. It wasn't picked up on camera. As far as I know. Mm. Part, yeah, part I heard two. A few. Yeah, part two, um, first day of filming, we had uh, we had the big howl over over that bog area. Yeah, but that was a different area. That was up in Tyrone. More like a screech or a scream. More like a scream, really, wasn't it? Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what happened just for the folks there. We were uh, we were just filming uh, uh, for the documentary that day. It was very cold. When we were, we sent Ron and the cameraman back to the vehicles to bring some of the equipment that we didn't need anymore back. And just as they were coming back, we had a hell. We, you know, myself and Chris were setting up lunch and we had coffee and a few sandwiches and stuff like that there. So we were just putting out the ground sheet and we were just setting then to get the stuff, a bit of food, hot food ready for the guys. And uh, the guys are coming back. They were about, I'd say, 80 yards away from us and I put my hand up to stop them. Cameraman and Ron were talking away and uh, they they actually stopped when I put my hand up and this howl came out. I can't explain it. Um, I'd say it was no more than 100 yards away further on down the trail and it was nothing I ever heard before. Uh, I think it shocked everybody. Ron was for the he could hear as well. And I think Ron is very good at explaining exactly what it sounded like. So Ron, if you want to take it away from there. Um, from what my experience with, with animals and what we have in Ireland, uh, initially I thought it was like a donkey, you know, with a, like a high pitch and like a donkey would only let out a high pitch for maybe four seconds at most. This just carried on, and then the the depth of the the howl just deepened and deepened, and it just got heavier and heavier, and it just went on for like twelve to fifteen seconds. Uh, never heard anything like it in my life. Not well, enough. Talk, well, I was gonna say, let's talk a little bit about some of the animal life over there, because when we hear things on, like in North Carolina, for example, the first thing that any skeptical person or even cynical people would say, and I'm one of those people, I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to this subject in general, but a lot of people say, well, it was a coyote, right? And that's about the only thing outside of maybe a fisher cat or something like that that would make some of the screams and howls that people hear over here. Let's talk a little bit about that. Ron, you mentioned the, the wildlife over in Ireland. Is there anything over there that like big cats is, is another thing that comes out over here, mountain lions and things like that scream and make these noises? Is there anything out there, maybe besides a donkey, like you mentioned, that could be responsible for any of these vocalizations that people are reporting? Um, no, we do have big cats here, but sightings are rare. Um, now, there is reports of sightings every year, but even speaking to deer hunters, they hardly ever see them, they don't hear them. Uh, you will get maybe cows at nighttime, uh, Deers won't make a noise, and you might get a fox call, a standard fox call. So that's only like a, a quick yelp. Um, nothing else would really make noise during the night unless there's dogs off in the distance or anything like that. But nothing else. Um, we have a lot of deer here, uh, plenty of foxes. 
or anything else on the lines of that you want. It's everything is kind of fairly distinguishable. There's there's nothing really unusual. Gotcha. Chris, I see you shining your light. If there's anything that happens, you start getting activity, just butt in and we'll stop wherever we're at and and you just tell us what's going on out there. But while I've got Ron, let's go ahead and talk about some of your personal experiences, Ron. What have you experienced while you've been out in the field? You said you've had encounters with these things. What what have you been having go on when you've been out in the field? Uh, my encounters basically have been with the guys while filming. Um, I've I've been out a few times myself, um, say around the west coast of Ireland, and I've moved a small bit in to central Ireland where the main kind of forest line starts for Ireland and it just carries right up through the country. I found a few different things. I found uh, one big X, which is kind of unusual of the placing where it was. I sent pictures to the guys there. Um, like we have an abundance of deer all over Ireland. So a food source is not a problem anywhere. Um, my experiences would be the first day of filming that big howl that we heard or a roar, whatever you'd call it. Uh, it wasn't really a high pitched howl for so long. Just as I said, it kind of dropped down into a big, big kind of a whale for a finish. Uh, also that day we were doing calls on, on radios. Like we split up into two groups across that area and we did, we did some calls over and back and, we actually have it on camera that um, and recordings as well of Chris did a call and we got a call back from the opposite direction, basically. That was all in the same day. Um, we've found big uh, bends um, in one area where we researched for the last two years. Uh, Jim will fill you in more on the, that area that we've been filming in. We've had great success there. Um, I've kind of been the guy that's doing the most listening and sound with, um, how would you call him? Um, what's the the mic that I have, Chris? The parabolic. The parabolic mic, yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've been doing a lot of work with that uh, through filming and I've heard a lot of stuff that's later been confirmed with with our extra footage of eye shine that we have got. But I'm still waiting for a daylight sighting. I I know one area that I really want to go to that I'm nearly sure I will. I've had uh, close friends now, say who I've met with in, in the last couple of years that have had sightings themselves. So I'll I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll see a sighting. But uh, I know a lot of stuff I've witnessed um, mm. has been in the dark, and I can't 100% confirm neither. But to rule it out is hard because there's nothing else that's similar to it. Like you couldn't say it's a bear. We don't have bears here. Um, we don't have anything bigger than, say, horses. That like we don't have many wild horses. Actually, they're all kind of in fields. We do have wild goats and obviously deer as well, but nothing that's seven, eight foot tall with glowing eyes, <laughs> basically. Um, the guys have more success. They've been out uh, a lot longer than me. So um, that's, that's where I stand anyway at the moment. Well, Jim, let's talk about some of your experiences while you've been out there. You've obviously been doing this for a while. What kind of things have you seen and heard and experienced when you've been out in the field? Yeah, we've. Uh, there was one instance that we were on. Myself and Chris were on a trail. We walked down this trail, this you know very isolated area. We walked down. Uh, we did a little bit of filming down the end. We were only gone about five minutes, and when we came back, there was a stick. Uh, not a big stick, but a definite stick shoved in the middle of the path. And there was nobody else, nobody around. That was one thing. Uh, my first initial sighting was, uh, I don't know whether it was that same day or not, but I'm not sure. I think it was, Chris. I'm not sure whether it was or not. But uh, we, It was on my left-hand side. I just got this grey sort of a flash, which I 
it actually looked like a big sheet of, say, galvanized steel moving from the left to the right at about 100 yards away through the forest. And uh, when I say moving, it was the... I think he froze up on us. Are you still with us, Jim? No, he's, he's, he's frozen. Fro he's frozen in time. Being, I just got a flash. Did we disappear there, uh, Brian, for a while? You lost, yes, we lost you for about 10 seconds there, yeah. Yeah, let me – hold on. Let me go back, Jim, and see what the last thing you said was here so we can kind of pick up at the same spot. Sorry, but that just disappeared. I've, uh, I've got strong Wi-Fi here. I don't know what happened. All right, so you basically got to uh, – hold on, let me, let me crop that right quick so I don't have to do it later. Luckily, I'm a good editor. It'll be like this shit never happened. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> That's good. So basically, you got to uh, the movement, and you were about to go into when you – you said basically what I mean by movement. So just pick up there, and we can go on from there. Yeah, this thing I've seen on the left-hand side was uh, it went from the left to the right, moved across. Uh, it was very tall, gray in color. Uh, it just caught the left-hand side of my eye, just the movement. And when I turned to look, it was so quick. It went from, as I said, left to going towards the right, about 100 yards away through the, through the bog. And uh, it had that classic sort of a floating effect. When they say when I say floating, there was no head bobbing. It's the the guy on a bicycle sort of thing. You know where they they go. They just sort of go. There's no head movement up and down. That was my first sighting. Uh, unfortunately, the cameras were facing in the other direction when that happened. It's always you know. Um, the my class A sighting was in during filming for the third installment of our documentary, which uh, which was awesome. It's it's I'll never forget it. Uh, basically, we were heading up this trail. We looked at it earlier on, and we, you know, I decided I'm an avid deer hunter. So I said, okay, there's an area here that opens up about 300 yards, two or 300 yards by 150 yards, big square, just in front of the valley in, in a nice area for seeing deer. So I said to the guys, I'll just go ahead in the, you know, uh, like in the anticipation of seeing, maybe seeing some deer out. So I didn't see any deer, but I had my high-powered laser, which I had in my hand like so. And uh, I was shining it, it around. And I seen on the left-hand side this big three. And what I thought was a big, massive uh, clump of ivy growing on the side of the tree. So I hit it with the laser. And the second I hit it with the laser, it went straight down. Now, it was about maybe 100 yards, 90, 100 yards around that distance, a little bit more or less. Uh, it had a small head on its shoulders, but it was at least four feet across, jet black. And as I said, it just went down and the hair stood up on my back and on my arms and on my neck. I couldn't believe what I've just seen. And it's only from that point on that uh, I called the guys up from behind and Ron had a look there as well, trying to see where it was. But that was my uh, my biggest ever sighting. But that, that same night, myself and Ron were heading on down at one of the smaller trails. We had a couple of gifts left out. We'd done a bit of a a bit of a thread, you know, like sewing thread traps around the trees to see what they break it. One was uh, about two and a half, three foot high, and the other one was over six feet high. So we were just setting those up. And uh, myself and Ron were uh, we could hear tree sticks breaking, definite bipedal footsteps all around us that night. And uh, the eye shine, which we didn't know at the time, uh, was caught on, on the cameras uh, during the you know editing process. But uh, that can be seen, all seen on the, you know, in the documentaries. And there's, um, <clears throat> we got double eye shine there on, it only showed up in infrared. When you shine ordinary lights on it, it didn't show up at all. But with the infrared cameras, you could see the eye shine. And one was about 
eight and a half feet, and the other one was about 10 feet tall, left and right. We ended up getting out of there and heading back to the car. And when we got back to the car, we were just talking about it. And then the cameraman said, hey, guys, the eye shine is right behind you again. So that was, even now, I can feel the hair on my arm standing up. That was uh, some of our, that was just some of the stuff that we have. But uh, I'm sure Chris has uh, has a lot more to talk about as uh, he is the guy doing all the filming and he's uh, the technical guru when it comes to uh, cameras and stuff like that. So uh, what we have and what we've caught on on uh, on camera cannot be denied. And uh, a lot of it was we didn't know we had it until the until the film was finished, until it was you know editing that. Uh, wow, look at this behind us. We didn't know it was there. Let's talk a little bit about the gifting thing, because that's something that's hit close to home here recently, because I believe everybody's heard the story. I'm not going to go into it in depth, but basically a turtle shell showed up on the stump here and I started what I believe to be gifting with something. And now I've had two jars of sun butter, basically sunflower seeds ground up into like peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And I've had two jars taken so far. One was a very small mason jar that I put out there. And then the latest one was an actual full size, like peanut butter jar size of sun butter and an apple was taken as well. And, you know, it could have been an ungulate. It could have been a coyote. It could have been any number of things. Raccoons will carry things off. I'm perfectly aware of that. I've never said that it was Bigfoot, but it's suspicious to me because the first time it was taken, I did not have a trail camera on it. The trail cam was up, but I didn't have batteries in it and no SD card because I've never had activity when I've had the camera actually functioning. Now, this last time I was excited because when I went out to the stump, the camera was supposed to be functioning properly, had brand new batteries in it that were less than a week old. And I go out and the apple's gone and the jar of sun butter's gone. And I'm giddy because I know my camera's supposed to be working. I go over and open up the camera. And the first thing that I see, it's, it's not on. So I have to turn the camera like off and then on. And I get a notification that it's in low battery mode and it will not capture night vision shots in low battery mode or whatever, which I yeah. thought was weird because I've never seen that. Long story short, there's over 2,000 pictures and videos on this SD card to the wow. point where it, it does a file. And then when it got to 999, it switched over to a different file. And there's like another 255 because it takes photos and then like 10 seconds of video. Right. Ooh. But there's not one shot at night, nothing out of the 2000 plus shots. And there's nothing showing any of the stuff disappearing, but it's clearly gone. So that was a long winded way to ask you guys, have you had any kind of success when you guys are doing gifting? If so, what are you leaving out and are you getting things in return? Are you having success there at all? What we had was we put out, I brought a lot of uh, very colorful, small shot, little shot uh, yeah, where bourbon or whiskey glasses but they, which they showed up, they actually glow at nighttime. You know, they sort of uh, they have uh, this, uh, they're sort of luminous. And uh, what we had was, I had four of them set out on the top of this, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a tree stump. And there was moss growing on top of this tree stump. And we were shoving these glasses, twisting them down, and they were well in there. So they weren't going to move. And when we came back the next day, the uh, all the threads were fine. They weren't touched. But one of the glasses, was lifted up and moved uphill and placed there. So if you if it was an animal that hit it, it would have fallen down. But this went up. So that is basically the only bit of action we have we have got on the gifting. But um the on the trail cameras we use them in a different way. We use them as we know that they can see them and they avoid them and we use them to channel them into our gifting area. Well, that's a really good idea because I, when I first started the gifting thing, I was getting messages from folks. I was posting about it on social media and people were saying, if it's a gifting situation, they're not going to come in and do that if there's a camera. But I'm like, you know, I don't want to be the guy who sets something up and it disappears and I don't get anything on camera. So I put the cameras up and I still didn't get anything. So 
it's so frustrating because I was excited that this stuff, even if it was a raccoon and I thought I'm, yeah. I might even catch a coyote doing something really cool. And I was just excited to have the footage, but literally there was nothing. And of course you get the, the people when you post about it saying, Oh, well, imagine that something didn't work properly when a supposed Bigfoot took something off the stump. Well, you know, I don't know that that's what it was, but I do think it's an interesting part of the story that the camera has been working fine and now it's not and stuff's disappearing. So yeah. are you guys finding outside of the X structure that somebody talked about or the X formation, are you guys finding stick structures? Are you finding footprints that are suspicious? Are you finding like structures, TP structures and that kind of stuff out there as well? We've uh, uh, during the first doc documentary, we have, uh, we, uh, you know, myself and Chris were, were looking around this area and it was after being snowing that week. But we came across uh, just the top of the mountain where there was, there was only, it was the only place that had snow left. You know, we, we, all the rest had thawed away. So we went up there and we found uh, 23 inch human type uh, footprints in the snow. Along with smaller ones, they were a family group sort of walking around in the area. But we were, uh, you can see that captured on the on the first documentary. We have that filmed. But uh, yeah, we have found those uh, structures. I'll let Chris talk about the structures. We've uh, come across so many of those. I think uh, Chris is nearly an expert at those at this stage. Well, I'm going to combine, I'm going to combine that there with what uh, Brian was talking about, about the gifting, because um, on, one, on one occasion, it was about, I think maybe 2018 or so, maybe early 2019 possibly winter time anyway 2018 2019 and um one of the local bogs that i, I would um go to quite often um i've done a few, quite a few live feeds there over the years um it's about it's not that far from here actually it's about 20 miles the crow flies maybe from here but um there was one occasion where um i had actually been doing a, a bit of knocking and stuff as you do and that does produce um, responses from time to time. But at this sort of stage, I think sort of the, the Bigfoots in that area um, were getting a little bit more used to me. And sometimes I sort of like to play games. And at this point, I, I, I was actually quite regular there, Brian. I was maybe there like, you know, twice a week sort of thing, because it's not, it's not that really that far from home. So twice a week, maybe I was there. and. Um, one day I pulled up and literally just got out of the car and got an axe through the way. And I looked to my left, just from the car, and there was a big stick. So this big stick was like pushed into the ground. And I said, right, okay, maybe, I thought, you know, maybe, potentially maybe that's been left by another squatcher or maybe even that they've maybe done that the to, you know to initiate me to sort of play games or whatever with with them or whatever it was, but actually that's what it was. They had actually, but I believe they had actually left this thing pushed in the ground. So I had a knock, and the the moment I done that, they immediately responded. So I took the stick with me. It was daylight. It was daylight, and I I I walked up the trail probably about a mile up the trail and there's a little spot where I had found a few like sort of strange um sticks not not big tree structures but little stick structures and stuff and ground lifts and things they got there. So I says well but what I'll do is I'll bring the stick there. So I brought it there and lo and behold when I got there there was like a little Y structure with another stick sort of leaning on it. And um I got this big stick and I had to knock off the tree and then placed the stick on top of this Y structure. And that was okay. So I went all about my business as you do, went squatching and walked around the bog for a couple of hours. Um, didn't see or hear nothing else at the time, but got back to the car and just walking up to the car is a little bit of a slight bit of a hill up out of the bog, and um, a bog, by the way, in case some of the viewers don't know what it is, it's uh, our version of a swamp, so it's um, it's just it's called a bog over here, but anyways, um, 
up this little bit of a hill towards the car. And no joke, exact same stick was in the ground beside the car. So that was obviously confirmation that they were playing games. And the moment I lifted the stick out of the ground and banged the tree beside me, bang back. Which That's I thought very interesting. Was, yeah, I thought it was, you know, obviously it gave me the major creeps at that stage because that was confirmed then. You know, the first time before entering the bog, you know, you were thinking, is it, is it, you know? But back to the car, stick on the ground, another knock at the same position and another knock back. So there was just no, there was no question that there was definitely either maybe some really strange human playing games with me or, <laughs> or, or definitely was an Irish Bigfoot. So who knows? Well, let me ask you, Chris, what do you make of, and this is for Ron or Jim, either one, but let me ask you, what do you make of the stick structures? Because that's something that I find here on the property often could be deadfall, could be something else, but people report those often. And it's in association with areas where people have had encounters and, or they maybe heard things or had encounters themselves, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why they do those things. Do you have a theory on what those are? Do you think it's a playful thing? Do you think they're marking territory? What, what do you think's up with the stick structures? Well, first of all, I definitely believe that, um, uh, Tree structures, as opposed to the, the stick structures, are definitely Bigfoot related in most cases. Now, of course, in certain cases, there are humans have the potential to make certain ones, um, probably even most of them. But in remote remote areas, miles from any road, why would a human just go in there and, and construct whatever it is? You know what I mean? But some some of the some of the, the structures that we have found here, and um, same same as some of the guys that over in North America and Russia and places who have found some of these things to be absolutely huge. Uh, photographer who I know, he's no interest in Bigfoot whatsoever, but he knows that I have. And um, uh, it's out of the blue one day, he sent me a, a bend, which was up in the Morn Mountains. Um, one of the forests up in the Morn Mountains was on the east coast of, the east coast of Ireland. Um, and this bend was absolutely huge. Absolutely, it was an entire, an entire pine, pine tree, fir tree, or conifer, or whatever it was, was just bent right over, and shoved into the ground and weighed down with other big logs. I mean, a full tree, not not just a little tree, you know, a big big tree bent over. It was absolutely huge. Not not there. There's no question in my mind what done that, because for anybody to do that, they'd have to have a a a, a large piece of machinery to do that. And they'd have to navigate that through that forest to get in there. And probably it was halfway up the mountain. So it was just impossible for a human being to create with, with you know, manpower or, or with machinery. So, I mean, it, it, it definitely is Bigfoot related in most of the cases, I believe. But what they mean is up for debate, of course. Um, I, I don't really um, have a a solid view on, on what it would be. But I do believe the, the bends to be maybe um in, in that case is look at how strong I am. Look at you know, look how big I am and strong I am. Don't mess with me. Um some of the uh, the territory markers like upside down trees, they've we find them here too, where a tree has just been completely uprooted, turned upside down and shoved into the ground. That is definitely a territory marker. That's like, you know, saying this is my spot. Stay out, don't come in here. Whether you're a human or another Bigfoot, don't come in here, you know. And I've felt that presence in those areas before too. That, in my word and in, in my thought, is definitely a given. That is what that is. As for axes and those things, some squatters believe that um, there's different axes. There's a wide axe, there's an arrow axe. Some believe it means welcome, believes it means a warning. That is up for debate, you know. But um, definitely... In most cases, structures are definitely Bigfoot related. It's all subjective. You know, nobody really knows unless you have one that you're studying. And I don't think anybody has one. So anything we talk about is obviously subjective. Let's talk a little bit about some of the sighting reports that you guys gather. I'm assuming with your organization, you guys have a Facebook group. Are you getting reports from other people that have seen these things? And if so, 
what kind of physical description are you getting? Are they seven, eight, 10 feet tall? I'm very curious about that because you're probably familiar with some of the different things we get over here. The Pacific Northwest, they tend to be bigger. And like down in the South, East where I'm at in Florida, the skunk apes tend to be a little bit smaller. What are you guys getting as far as physical descriptions over there when people come face to face with these things? What do they look like? How big are they? And what kind of physical description are you getting? Well, um, and, and sorry, 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 I believe, our mutual belief in the organization that there is at the very least two different types of Bigfoot in Ireland. Um, and that simply goes on, on the sightings and on the, especially on the footprints. Um, the wood as we would call it would be um, the Wudawaza or the wild man would be, it's believed to be a Neanderthal basically. Um, it has a print that is very similar to a Neanderthal print. And then of course we have the grey man, um, which stems down from its Scottish ancestors. The, the grey man name really comes from Scotland. Uh, it's just called an Irish Bigfoot, but it has got the grey man sort of tag to it now here as well. Um, it is obviously a lot bigger, but unlike America, where you know maybe you've got the skunky up down in the south, the southeast, um, smaller um, Bigfoots, maybe you know the ones the boogers and stuff in the in the Midlands and uh, sort of the east where you guys are and out west, you've got the big squatch. That doesn't seem to be the case here. It's, they seem to mix in. Um, the woodwoose tends to stick to the sort of bogs and stuff like that. Maybe um, there has been reports on the east more so of them and down the sort of Midlands. There's actually a wild man festival down in the Midlands somewhere. I've never ever been to it, but I'm going to have to go sometime. But um, as for the grey man, the big the Irish Bigfoot, it seems to be absolutely everywhere, and it actually has it has, it has even showed up in Woodwoose territory. So, the area where Jim mentioned earlier on, where Jim had the sighting of the grey thing going on his side, presumably it was a grey man. It may have been a grey Woodwoose, who knows? Um, but going on Jim's height report of eight to nine feet tall, I would find that as a grey man, and. I had the same, well, almost the same sighting myself a couple of years back in the same area, maybe about a mile from there just, and it was the same thing. Whereas anybody in that area have reported the woodwoose, which is about seven feet tall, it's usually black hair, brown hair. Would you believe that? A jogger? <laughs> Jogger at this hour of the night <laughs> in the dark. My goodness, yeah. I'm not even a light. Yeah, there's, uh, there mean, is a lot of stories. Uh, there is a lot of stories that we've uh, that we know about, Brian. For instance, uh, there was uh, a man and a woman. Uh, they were walking their dog in. I think it was uh, uh, well, a Forest, which is up uh, uh, Chris's area. Uh, many years ago, uh, they came across this open, uh, newly felled patch of ground, you know, where there was trees lying down, logs everywhere, trees falling over. And the woman, the dog was going crazy barking. And uh, the woman said, there's somebody or there's somebody over there hiding, hunched down behind that tree on the ground over there, 40 or 50 yards away. So the guy got up, bit of courage, went over and he got within, say, about 20 yards of it. And this thing stood up and it had a big stick in its hand. It was... What, what the woman described was it was very thin, skinny looking, covered in hair, very tall, and uh, it made some grunting noises or some noise. It wasn't happy they were there. She was calling her husband back, and the dog again was going crazy. Then she said, This creature turned and ran, but it didn't make a sound, and it was nimble enough to leap and bound and hop in between the trees and not make a sound. and and she said it looked very, very comfortable in that area where it was running. Extremely fast, but there was no, you know, it was nimble enough to avoid everything. That was one, uh, uh, you know, case that was there. There's another one. There was uh, this elderly gentleman driving home one night from work. Uh, he was going across the bog. And as he turned coming up, uh, there was a he was heading, coming towards this bridge. And this thing was on the side of the road, whether it was eating roadkill or what it was doing. He slowed down and put the, he put the high beams on. 
and it, he said it was a big creature. It stood up in front of him, got very, very aggressive, screaming, roaring, and advancing towards the car. And he said he had to put it into reverse and reverse out of there as quick as he could. And all the time, the creature was uh, advancing towards the car, screaming, roaring. So that's just two. Uh, there's another one there near Donegal side where there was a, this guy was walking. He would be classed as a semi-professional hill climber and walker, you know, sort of one of those guys, very fit and active. He was heading across one of the peaks up in, in, in uh, around on the Donegal border, which is uh, the northwest of Ireland, very, very rugged area. And he said he's seen what well, he thought there was a man following him you know, following from behind, 150, 100 yards behind, kept coming up. So he said that it was very tall, black. He said he thought it was wearing all black clothing. So he cut around the, he knew the shortcut and he cut around. He said he's going to have a, a better look at this. So when he got around the other side, he said it wasn't human, but it was human shaped. It was massive, it was covered in hair. But what he found strange was he came across these, a load of hunters but that he thought there were hunters in the area, but they were acting suspicious. They had maps open on the on on the bonnets of their truck or whatever. And the second they saw this guy, they took off. They they got out of town pretty quick. So whether these guys were hunting or were they hunting the same thing, you know, I don't we don't know. But that's just another one of the stories in the area. Chris has his own story there about the uh, the sleeper sized uh, uh, log that was thrown at him there uh, when he was doing a bit of researching in one of the areas there, if you want to tell that one, uh, Chris. He looks like he's hearing something. I don't know if the jogger's back. <laughs> if he gets dragged out of frame, we'll know it's not a jogger. You want to you want to share that story, Chris? Yeah, well, that, that was actually in a different area than here. This, I might, uh, that, that was about, that was my local blog I was speaking about earlier. But yeah, it, it actually was the jogger. Yeah, he's, he's maybe changed his mind about going in there. <laughs> um, so he's went the other way. Who knows why? But anyway, um, yeah, uh, that that was um, probably my first experience, you know, first A class experience. Anyway, didn't have any sighting, of course, but it was all it was all vocal and and and, and sound, you know, noise, but. I started. I started off with hearing with hearing chatter, um, on my right, and it, you know hard to explain, but people like then they call it like Japanese samurai chatter sort of thing, same thing. And I sort of thought to myself, I'm not hearing this. This definitely not. You know what I mean? I'm not hearing that. So I walked on down and down the trail, and I heard a, a grunt on my left then, like a really deep grunt. And then the chatter started again on the right. So I says, okay, right, fair enough. Something's going on, but um, walked on down the trail. And then um, as I headed down the trail, I started to hear heavy footfall on my left-hand side. Now the bog, um, being a swamp in case anybody's joined us halfway through, um, is usually, it can be up to five feet deep at times, but that time of the year there, it was maybe three to four feet deep. Um and of course, if it was a, if a human was walking through that bog swamp, you would um you would hear you know because of the depth you would hear them wading through it as opposed to walking. So you would hear like a swoosh, wouldn't you? You would hear like a whoosh, whoosh, with with the footsteps. But this wasn't doing that. It was just footsteps and splashes, just like splash, 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 and really heavy splashes. So I said, well, okay, that's not a human, probably. I was trying to figure out in my head what it potentially could be because there is wild boar in the area too, but I knew a wild boar couldn't maybe couldn't do that sort of stuff and it would maybe be swimming or I don't know why a wild boars even swim to be honest, but it would be doing something different as opposed to what was happening. But anyway, the chatter on the right eventually stopped, but this thing followed me right to the car, the same sort of spot where um, I found that stick um, a little bit later on, um, about a year or so after that. But just coming towards the car, up towards that little um, incline again, same same area, and um, the walking stopped just as quickly as it started. 
and standing there, I heard like a swoosh coming through the air, like as you hear something quick coming behind you. And plunk on the ground, bang beside me was a massive log, uh, a railroad railroad sized sleeper, sleeper sized log beside me on the on the ground. And whether that was intended to hit me or whether it deliberately missed me, I don't know, but um, certainly it was enough for me at the time. My being my first real proper encounter, I was literally quick as the heels into the car and out of there. So um, that was obviously a warning, a warning to me. But this particular, this particular area where I am now, this is one of one of the eight last encounters happened. Um, it was April 2019. It was almost four years ago now, and um, I decided to get the drone. At, at the time, I had a little. Um, I can't remember. It was a little, one of the little DJI ones anyway, and I didn't really have a big range, and I sort of had to sort of let it off for a bit and let it fly about for a bit and then bring it down. It was like a fifteen minute battery or something like that. You had to rechange it and so on. But I decided, you know, because I heard some of the guys having success with these things before, and I said, "Well, I'm going to try this." And there's a big bunch of woods here. Um, where I'm just sort of facing a bit of bog land here at the moment can't see it because it's dark there's the woods behind me there's woods this way there's woods that way and there's a trail that goes right round um this big sort of clump of woods to my left oh let's see what was that apologies but yeah um I proceeded to head around those woods and I let the drone off and Obviously, this drone is quite noisy. Um, people think that it's the maybe the lights flashing that does it, but I personally think it's just the noise that maybe attracts them. But let it off and took it down just before the battery run out and stopped and started again and set it off again. I had six batteries at the time, part, and I continued this process for about almost two and a half miles, and I eventually brought it down. I had one battery left at this point. And stopped, put the last battery on. I says, okay, it's a bit of open ground, so I wanted to send it across the open ground to see. Send it across, and obviously with the 15 minute battery, you're sort of you're worrying because you know compared to the drones they have now, my drone that they have at the moment is like a 31 minute battery time, which is great, and it's like a 12 kilometer re- range, which is fantastic. But this one here had a very short range. You literally, if if you threw it maybe. A couple of hundred yards, I started the but I get me home, you know. So, um, anyway, that was okay. Last battery done, and I just happened to look over, and I seen what at first thought was a uh, some weird sort of tree formation or whatever it was, and um, it was just standing direct, looking directly at me, um, and to its, to its left, to my right. There was like what I believe, what I thought was two heads bopping up and down from behind this hedge or bush. And I says, no, it couldn't be, you know. I thought maybe it was the wind, you know, creating this. But I seen sort of the, the one on the left sort of swing an arm out. And I says, right, okay. But this this was a this was quite a bit away. It was about roughly about 800 metres away from me. There's an open bit of bog land, which I think actually was a, old lake at one stage I think I seen it on TV one time there was maybe a lake there at one stage and over time it filled in became a bog or swamp as you do and these guys were literally at the edge of the woods at the far side so it was quite a distance away but could just roughly make this out but I thought nothing of it and I said right I'm going to head on and head along Ryan about another mile and a half and I just happened to look back um, in that direction and there was a big line of, line of trees going along a river and there was this dark mass up in, up in one of the trees. It was April time, so the leaves hadn't just, you know, came back on the trees just yet. The, the winter trees were still there, obviously, in the spring. And clearly there was something black and big up a tree. 100%. Whether that was a Bigfoot or whether that was a big cat, I don't know. It certainly wasn't a bear because we don't have them. 
Um, so it may have, you know, I thought maybe possibly a big cat because there has been big cat sightings here. So I thought maybe that there, and that was okay. So constantly this time you're putting things through your head and you're trying to pass it off, you know, because um, you're a rational person. But anyway, I came, came around to roughly where I am now, about 100 yards in front of me here, little trail that goes off here, and heading along there, and I just got that feeling, as, as some people do. And there's there was the bushes alongside the trail on the left, very, very thick bushes. The bushes were roughly about six feet tall, or just sitting on the top of my head sort of thing. And got that feeling, as I say, and having to look to my left and seeing a massive cone head on the other side of the hedge, which was literally three feet from me. And it just bumped straight down behind the hedge right beside me. And this hedge was six feet tall. And this thing was clearly way over that, way over that. There's a bit of a, I found out later on that there was a bit of a drop behind that hedge, which made this thing easily nine feet tall. So this thing was literally like right beside me. I just seen the head going down like that. At that point, I was I was waiting for the Matt Moneymaker one, or you know, it just sticks his head out of the out of the hedge. <laughs> I was just waiting for that one. So it says, "Get me out of here now!" And before that did happen, you know, but thankfully that was enough for it. But the funny thing is, there, guys, at that point there was no sound whatsoever. So that thing had possibly tailed me for maybe two miles without no sound whatsoever. And even when it was right beside me, it just straight down and that was it. Completely silent. Yeah, it's a scary thing to think about, man. And I've I've had people tell me things similar to that in the past, how close these things can be and they hear nothing, which has always really, really fascinated me. I want to ask you guys this. We're going to obviously get into the documentary before we close out here, but I want to talk a little bit about the woo part of Bigfoot, right? That always comes up in every conversation. Are you guys having experiences out there or hearing about other people's experiences where there's things like orbs and things in the sky, lights in the sky, or other things that would be considered the woo part of Bigfoot? And that's for Jim, Ron, Chris, whoever wants to take that. Because I'm curious to see if you guys are experiencing the same thing that we're having over here. Because I just did a show a couple of, I don't know if it was this past Friday, I think it was the Carter Bouchard show, The Evidence of an Enigma. And he had some really out there stories that he's documented in his latest book. And people are having these weird experiences with what they believe to be Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Are you guys having the same thing over there, Jim, and getting these weird orbs and things like that that go along with these encounters? It, well, get, what happened was uh, during part three of our documentary, it's actually caught caught on camera. Uh, Chris's headlight uh, starts going crazy and turning itself on and off by itself uh, out of the blue. And this never, this is a quite reliable piece of equipment. Never let him down. New batteries, everything, the whole lot, and it just started going on and off. But we've had some unusual sightings in the sky uh, while in certain areas but we you know what do you say is, is it a ufo or what is it but you know but we've had those we've, we've definitely had those chris has had quite a few actually then rather than i've seen a couple of myself but uh the uh the headlights on and off that was uh very unusual you know well let's let's talk a little bit about the documentary how did you guys get to the point where you thought you were going to make a documentary and now you're three parts in? So what can people expect when they go and check those out? What's one, two, and three about? And what where can they find it? I'll let Chris answer that one. He'll be the expert on that. I just lost my sign there, guys, for a brief second. If you just repeat the question, Brian, sorry about that. Oh, you're good. I was just talking about the documentary. Like, what? How did that come about? What made you guys decide a to do a documentary? And then, what is in each part of that? What What can people expect when they go and check it out? And where can they find it? Well, um, the initial the, the initial thing from from me was the was the document, obviously sightings that, that people have had, and to let other people hear those sightings. Um, that was. The main, the main, the main reason, and obviously to, to get the word out 
um, to others. That that was the, that was the main objective of the first one, was to get you know other people to come forward. Basically, you know that was the whole idea of it. And but, you know at the time I was still in sort of um, disbelief at the time myself, and I didn't really you know I was in two minds of whether they are here even at that point myself. Um, but yeah, that was the initial the initial thought at the time was that we make a documentary, we can um, not only get the word out, but we can hopefully attract others to bring the word in. And um, that was that was the whole idea. But um, obviously, you know, when you make one, uh, something happens in one, and then you've got to go and explain that. So part two comes along, and then something happens in part two, you've got to go and explain that. So it's a sort of a, sort of a, a conveyor belt, you know, of one of just like the Finding Bigfoot series and stuff or whatever else, those guys sort of have to go and repeat themselves and and um and and, and explain this, explain that, and so on, and then go right and go right and test it out for themselves. So that's exactly what we done, but um of course it has a spiral effect, you know, especially where we were concerned, where we just felt that we had to go out and um see if that was the case indeed, especially with the encounters that we had ourselves. You know, to go out and say, did that happen? So let's go out and weigh it up and, and see, you know. So that, that was the that was the main the main reasons behind it, you know. So now all three of the parts are out of the documentary. Where can people reach out to you guys? Do you have a Facebook group? And where's the best pe- place for them to go and consume and, and find the documentaries? The documentaries are yeah. currently on Amazon, Amazon Prime. So um Amazon uh, have a weird thing. Uh, I'm not sure why some of the other guys now will probably tell you the same thing. Um, some of the other guys who make these sort of shows, but um, Amazon make the rules, unfortunately. So we don't make the rules. We don't make the charges. They do all of that. Um, and they decide whether you can have that on Prime or whether you have to pay for it. And unfortunately, Ours were well. Our films were on Prime until not so long ago, but Amazon changed the whole rules um, a couple of years back. And they actually, at one point, they actually decided to stop letting this sort of stuff on the onto the platform. And I think maybe they sort of allowed maybe stuff that was on it already to stay on, but they weren't going to allow any new content in the documentary uh, genre at all, which would have blew. All of us guys, right? Not just us, but all, all the guys making these sort of shows, UFO shows, all the stuff would have been just wiped off the, the face of the platform completely. But they changed their mind, and they only allow certain shows on Prime. So there, there is a there is a charge for it. You can rent it. The best rent is probably the best option if you want to just watch it once, obviously. But if you want to keep watching shows like myself, where I sort of binge watch things, um, best to buy, of course. But yeah, um, Amazon is is, is, the, is the place for the for the documentaries and um, for any information that people people want, we've got a Facebook page. It's just the Irish Bigfoot Research Organization, and the organization organization is spelled with an S, not with a Z. Um, and we've got a Facebook group as well, with just over sort of three thousand members in it. Um, Jim's the boss of that, so Jim can tell you more about that there, but. Um, certainly that's that's the main platforms we have. We do have a YouTube channel. Some of our content is on there. We do have some content on it. But we do really need to work on that, to be honest. We need to put more stuff on that. But um, these things take time, of course. Brian, you, you, you know the, the score yourself. <laughs> I can definitely relate, man. I am a member of the group. I will link to all of that stuff on, in the show notes for you guys to go over and check out the documentaries check out the facebook group it's an awesome group jim ron chris thank you guys so much for being with me on the show i've had a blast talking to you guys we'll have to do this again thank you very much brian it's been a pleasure they say you don't gotta go home but you can't stay